computer networking and those protocol layers like Ethernet, TCP, IP and all that stuff was kind of confusing to me when I was younger. Then at university I was introduced to the OSI layer model, but it was just an abstract model and I still didn't understand it. It took me a while until this whole concept of layered packets, OSI layer model and so forth clicked. So now in this video I will try to explain it to you, the basics of computer networking. At the start I will be using paper to illustrate networking, but at the end we will make the bridge over to sockets and bits and bytes. So hopefully it will click for you too. On this side here we have computer A and on this side here is computer B and let's say we want to send this text message between those two. How could we do that? Well, I could just pass this paper over, right? Correct. I mean handing over a physical piece of paper is what we humans can do. With actual computers it's a bit different but also the same. It could be called the physical layer of computers. But of course a computer does a bit more magic taking this text and using electricity to send then zeros and ones over a wire or using radio waves over the air. And if the sender and the receiver speak the same protocol like we humans know what to do when we get handed a piece of paper, then we transmit it, a message. That is cool. We can send a message back and forth. But as you know, the internet is a bit more complex. There are not just two computers, but many more. So in order to support multiple computers, we need some way to address them and find them. Introducing the IP layer with IP addresses to identify sender and receiver. But to find the correct computer with an IP address, we need help. Like in the real world, we use the postal service to find the destination. Here we use another computer for that. We call it a switch. So when we now want to send this text, we need to know the IP address of the recipient. In this case, it's 192.168.1783 and we are 192.168.1782. So before we hand this paper over to the physical layer, we need to attach this additional information onto it. Or rather, we create a new IP header which contains the source and destination IP. And then we append the data that we want to send. And now we hand this whole package or packet over to the physical layer. It will then use zeros and ones to transmit it to the other computer called the switch. It also has a physical layer speaking the same protocol so it can receive the paper and its physical layer hands over the paper to the next layer, the IP layer, and it can check Ah, the destination IP is IP 192.168.1783. I know this computer is plugged into my port number three. So physical layer, please forward it to there. Quick intervention. In reality, there is an ethernet frame containing a MAC address and the switches actually look at the MAC address, not the IP address to decide over what network cable to send the data and routers are the ones looking at IP addresses. So I'm sorry about this inaccuracy, but for our case, it's not that important. It's just a model, it's close to reality, definitely helps you to understand reality, but I had to simplify parts for the sake of the video length. So please forgive me, but regardless, give this explanation a chance. After the switch looked at the IP and figured out which network cable is the correct one, the IP layer gives it back to its physical layer and the data is passed over to the correct wire that is the target computer. This target computer of course also has a physical layer which can use the zeros and ones to assemble the paper again and hands it over to the IP layer. The IP layer can now check, oh the destination IP is my IP. This was really addressed to me. And there's also a source IP attached and we can remember that in case we want to send the response. So here's the text. The IP layer removed the IP address information and just passed on the data, the content of the packet. The computer received the text. However, this is also not enough yet because there are multiple programs running on each computer. How do we know which program should receive this text? For example, there could be a web server and a Minecraft server running on here. So let's introduce another layer, the TCP layer. The TCP protocol is very complex and not only does it contain a number called a port which is used to decide which program gets the data, but it also involves a complex back and forth to ensure data was really received. I don't want to get into those details here. In the last video about what is a protocol, we already mentioned this a bit. For us, we just focus on the port number. 
And as I mentioned, the port is a number that just references a program. So how can we send this text to the web server running on port 80 on the target computer? Well, we do basically the same again. First, we have to create a TCP header, which contains the source port, which is our program number, and the destination port, in this case 80. And we attach it to the text we want to send. Then we hand this whole package over to the IP layer. And then the IP layer now creates an IP header with the target and source IP and attaches the previous packet to it. This whole package is now given to the physical layer. It gets electrically transmitted to the switch. The physical layer there reassembles the bytes, hands it over to the IP layer. This layer knows the computer with this IP and instructs the physical layer to send it over that wire. Then it arrives as zeros and ones on the target computer. The physical layer rebuilds the whole packet and hands it over to the IP layer. The IP layer now looks at the IP header and sees, yep, this is addressed to me. Removes the IP header and hands over the remaining payload data over to the TCP layer. The TCP layer then removes the TCP header, looks at the port information and sees, ah, this is intended to port 80. Let me check what program that is. Ah, it's the web server process. So here web server, here is the text data. I hope you can kind of see how networking works for computers. And I think by having gone through this example to build up the layers, solving different problems, you can also see why we want to have these different layers. And this stacking of protocols is really powerful because it allows us to think in isolated manners and black boxes. Yeah, it was kind of crazy and complex to transmit the single text on a piece of paper. But if you can trust this whole technology stack below you, you can just ignore it, ignore how it actually works, black it out. Then as a hacker or a developer, you can focus on the things that matter. For example, if you want to send an attack text to this program, you need to know the IP address and the port, but having that, just pass it onto the black box and magically it appears a moment later on the other side we directly communicated with the web server, a straight connection, even though in reality we know that it was quite a bit more complex. And this thinking in black boxes works for every layer. Let's make the upper layer a black box. We don't need to know what this kind of text or data somebody sends. We don't need to know how addressing works. We imagine to be only this layer now. So if somebody tells us, yo, this text has to be sent to this port, we in isolation just do our part. We create our TCP header, and attach to it the data that has to be sent. And then we just pass it on to the next layer. And we don't need to know what's below us. All we care about is that a few moments later, magically it appears on the TCP layer on the target computer. So again, we can think of this as if we had directly communicated with the other TCP layer. And now all those weird OSI layer images with those arrows also make sense. Every layer has a well-defined protocol and task that it has to do, and it just does it. It doesn't care what the payload data that it was given to, and it doesn't care what happens with the whole packet of data given to the next layer. It just does its one job. And in this limited view of the world, we can imagine you are communicating directly with the other side of the protocol. Of course, this was pretty abstract, but now let's see how this works in reality. This hidden complexity, this black box thinking, is what the operating system or software libraries do for you. For example, when you create a TCP socket on a Linux system, be it in Python or in C, you are on this layer here and you want to send data. Now you just instruct the operating system with syscalls, so kernel functions, to take care of all of this. And this is what it means to give data to the next layer. In programming, in computers, giving data to the next layer can be imagined as simply calling the next function with the data. So here we call the syscalls, the kernel functions, to establish a TCP connection. And in the Linux kernel, you can find more functions. Here, for example, is the internal kernel function to send a TCP Synac packet. And following these send functions, we come to this function here, which has a great comment. It is our job to build the TCP header and pass the packet down to IP. So it can do the same plus pass the packet off to the device, the network device. As you can see, these layers are just functions. Some of them implemented by the kernel. Some of them could also be implemented by software libraries or by yourself. And now I hope it makes sense to you what happens when you use a utility like Netcat. 
This is a small program that basically helps us to do what we just did on paper to send data. And it has already the code written to call the necessary kernel functions. So we can use it on the target computer to listen on TCP port 1234 and then we can use netcat on our computer to connect to this target IP and port. We don't need to know exactly how it works, but when we type in text here and send this on the target, this text magically appears. Under the hood, there's a lot of stuff happening, of course. With Wireshark, you somewhat get an insight into that. So here, for example, is the actual TCP packet and you can see the payload is the text we sent. And here is the TCP header attached on top of it with the port. And above that is attached the IP header with the IP. Also here you can see one more layer that I excluded, the Ethernet layer with the MAC address. Also over here you have the hex dump view, you can see the raw bytes of the whole package. You can see this is exactly like the paper example. Okay, this was quite a lot, but I hope it clicked for you like it clicked for me as well. And if you pay attention, you start to see this layering everywhere. When you make a phone call, you don't directly talk to this other person. Your thoughts first get turned into voice or vibrating air molecules, then those air vibrations get modulated to electrical signals. This is then given to a wire that transmits it to the recipient and there this electrical signal is passed to a speaker which turns the signal into air vibrations again, which then get picked up by the ears and processed by the brain. So even though there's this complex chain that is happening, you can abstract this away. The phone and brain is a black box and you end up with a simple, easy to understand direct connection. You are talking with this person and you can think like this for computers as well. So my advice to you, accept black boxes. It's okay not to know how parts of a computer work. Being able to work with these abstractions can make you very efficient and powerful. You can focus on solving complex problems specific to that layer. However, as a hacker, it's also important to peek inside those black boxes. You can accept black boxes a lot of times, but never be satisfied with a black box. As a hacker, this should intrigue you and you would want to look inside this. Because while we think of these protocol layers in isolation, of course, they are not isolated. They are connected. They are functions calling other functions and they pass data back and forth. For example, do you find HTTP request smuggling vulnerabilities complicated? Well, it could be that it's confusing to you because this vulnerability is due to an interplay between HTTP and TCP. If you think of HTTP requests in isolation, request smuggling never makes any sense. So to understand this vulnerability, you need to look into the layers below and understand the relationship between TCP and HTTP and how servers use TCP for multiple HTTP requests and responses. I link some videos about request smuggling below in case you want to try to understand it again now that you have learned about protocols and network layers. Anyway, time to end this. If you like these videos explaining basic computer science term with a small twist about hacking, let me know what other terminology is confusing to you. And subscribe because in the next video I want to tell you what it means to have a network tunnel, secure tunnel, proxies, VPNs. So stay tuned.